can be seated. Well, today we want to say welcome. We want to say thank you uh, to all of the friends and family of Brother Roger Broom and of the Broom family. And uh, we just talked to the family a little bit as we met before we came out and talked about this day and uh, talked about how it's a day of many emotions. It's a day of many feelings. And uh, today I hope uh, that we all laugh a little bit, remembering uh, the good times and remember some of the, uh, the, the, the funny and the good things that we remember about Brother Roger. And I, and I hope that we cry a little bit, remembering the love that he had for us and that we had for him. And so today we are going to honor a special man. Uh, Brother Roger Broom, no doubt about it, was a special human being. And uh, we are thankful for his influence in this church. We're thankful for his influence in this community, in this family. And today uh, our hope and our prayer is that we honor him. Uh, but today we're also going to do something that we believe that he would want us to do uh, with all of our hearts. And that's we're going to honor his Lord and his Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, Brother Roger would tell you today that he was not uh, who he was without the hand of God in his life. And uh, we're thankful for the hope of heaven. And uh, I'm not going to preach too early, but uh, we've got a, a pretty special day coming up here in a few days, Easter Sunday. And uh, it's because of the promise of Easter that today is not goodbye. Uh, but just as Jesus rose from the tomb, and just as Jesus came back to life three days later, there's coming a day where we're going to see Brother Roger again. We're going to have a glorified body, a new body, and uh, we're so thankful for the hope of heaven. We're thankful for Jesus today. Uh, so I'm going to open us up in prayer, and then after I pray, I'm going to have you stand again, and we're going to sing a congregational hymn of Great Is Thy Faithfulness. So let's go to the Lord in prayer uh, before we get into our service. Lord, we love you today. And God, we thank you for this opportunity. God, Lord, it's an opportunity that we get to come and thank you for the life of Brother Roger Broom. God, we thank you for the work that you did in his life. God, today there will be sad times and there will be happy times. But God, above all those things, I know that there will be hopeful times because he trusted in your son Jesus. And Lord, those that have called upon the name of Jesus, Lord, this is not goodbye. That's not just a, a cliche. It's not just a saying. But Lord, it is a promise that this is not goodbye. It is just see you again soon. God, we thank you for that today. God, as we... Lord, have this moment of honoring the life of Brother Roger. God, help us to honor you. Lord, for we know that Brother Roger was who he was because of the grace of God. God, we thank you for that. We pray that you would be with the family today. Be with the friends that have gathered. God, I pray that you would, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, God, that he would encourage our hearts. He'd love on us today. He'd love on this family. God, he, that he would be a comforter and an encourager, Lord, and an upholder today of our hearts. Lord, we love you and we thank you, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Please stand with me this morning as we sing this hymn, Great Is Thy Faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God, my Father. Peace that endureth thy 
thy faithfulness morning by morning new mercies i see all i have needed thy hand hath provided great is thy faithfulness lord unto me amen you can be seated this morning. At this time, we are going to have the Reverend uh, Pastor Gene Flack is going to come and give us a word, and uh, you give him your attention this morning. I got a big Bible, so I need to move all this other stuff out of the way so I can get it on here. It's big. Because like Roger and Patricia, I'm old, <laughs> and I can't see, <laughs> and I can't hear. <laughs> we come to that stage of our life where, you know, we, we have to kind of feel our way around. But uh, uh, Patricia and family, uh, my, it's, what an honor. I, I, I don't mind saying, and this may sound weird to some people, but I have looked forward to the joy and the honor of being here today with you because our lives go back until the beginning of time, don't they? <laughs> it seems that far back, it seemed like. When I came here to Sis Memorial in 1975, I was as lost as a man could be lost. I was living in sin. I never thought about coming to church until a lady here at Sis Memorial uh, invited my wife Jeannie to come to a revival, and she did, and she got revived and came home and told me about it. And uh, she got up on Sunday morning to go to church. And I said, where are you going? And I said, well, I think I'll go with you. <laughs> and, of course, it took a while to get her revived. But we finally got that done. And, and uh, we, we came to church and sat way back there on the back. Did y'all know y'all hear this testimony every time I come here? You know why? Because it's so special to my heart. You know, I'd still be lost if it weren't for people like Roger and Patricia Broom and so many of y'all that took me under your wing and loved me at the time that I was the worst sinner in the world, driving a beer truck all over Fort Mill, lost like I said, and you helped me get to the place where I understood the love of God, Patricia, and I thank God for that. It not only happened here in church, in Bible study, it happened every Sunday night. Those of you that were uh, here back then will know that. Uh, somebody, I think it was uh, Sandra Phillips, told me, while ago said, we need to have a cyst memorial reunion. And I said, well, we are. Look around. We are. But I remember those Sunday nights going to different holes, having cake and coffee. Fellowship was sweet. We enjoyed one another. And the love of God was very evident. And we all enjoyed it. But we went over to Patricia's house. It was a different experience because she made some of that water coffee. I remember Preacher Dry asked her one time, said, did you just pour that coffee out to speak it straight? Uh, you know, you could hold it up and you could see through it. It, it was so weak looking. And uh, we went to visit Trish not too long back, and, and I asked her, I said, you got some of that water coffee? <laughs> and we fixed a cup of coffee and sat down and talked. But, but it was always sweet. You know, home to home we would go, and you were so instrumental, like I said, in coming to that place where I knew I had to make a decision in my life, and you're part of that. Those of you that were here then and spent 20 years together before the Lord called me into ministry, you are a major part of my life, and so is Roger. Went out to see Roger, I don't know how long, what, three or four months ago. I don't know where you were going, Trish, but I went out there and sat with him all day. Well, I think you and women were out partying somewhere. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, I, I sat there, and, you know, Roger and I, we'd talk for 30 minutes, and then we'd take a nap for 30 minutes. Uh, <laughs> Both the same way, you know, after a while, we, and he'd be talking, and he'd just kind of, in the middle of a sentence, he'd just, and I said, all right, it must be time to nap, so I'd join him, and we had some good times together. Went up recently to help him out on a deck, I think Brother Walden, some others came up, and we, uh, we went out there and worked on that deck, and old Roger would come out there and sit. You know, at one time, he was probably the best carpenter in all of York County. He was a good carpenter. And he sat on that deck, and he said, man, I wish I could do what y'all are doing. I wish I could still do that. And i tell you this much. It was evident he was a good carpenter because when we tried to take that deck apart, 
it was already rotten, and we still couldn't get it apart. He built it so strong. He built it so well. And, uh, and that, that kind of carpentry comes in, uh, you know, uh, as, as a big help, even when you go on mission trips. I remember going to Mississippi uh, after the Katrina hurricane, and Roger and I and others went down there to do some work at a church and worked all week. I mean, it's hard work, hard work. Had a great time in the Lord. And then, of course, Roger decided to go with us on a mission trip down to Peru. I'm, we thought we'd be in a little city, you know, and then get in a car or something, go out in the jungle where we were doing the work. Well, we didn't. We went out in the jungle, and that's where we stayed. And uh, we walk up to the job. They'd say, watch where you're walking, because there are panthers, anacondas, and all kinds of stuff, you know. So we, we lived in fear the whole week. <laughs> but I know we went up and started building a house for some missionaries that were there. And we'd gotten started, had about eight or ten of us, and couple of guys and started putting down the framing and the floor and the foundation and after they got along on the way they realized they were doing it wrong something was not working Roger was doing something else over there I don't remember what he was doing but I know they said hey we're gonna have to tear all this out and put it back together and Roger came and said, no 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 you don't have to do that years of carpenter experience he said just do this and he put a little board down right there and it all worked it was perfect <laughs> How do he do that? How do he know that? He just knew about being a carpenter. There was something else that he knew. He knew his Savior and his Lord. I don't know how many times as we sat there and talked and fell asleep that he said, Gene, I am ready to go. Family, y'all heard him say that, didn't you? I'm ready to go. When God's ready, I'm ready. And, of course, that's why we're here today. Of course, the question now is not for Roger. It's for you and I. Am I ready? Am I ready? I asked Reed how long I was supposed to take, and he didn't really give me a time. But I know Patricia told me, he said, you know, please say something in case somebody's here that doesn't know Jesus Christ would know that. And I said, well, I'm going to get a scripture here that uh, I know would summarize, you know, what Jesus tried to say to us. And I want to get one that's pretty simple. Because we have this habit of making getting saved, coming to Christ, so hard. I don't know how we conjure up in our minds all the reasons why we can't do that. And maybe if you're here today and you don't know this same Savior that Roger knew, then I'm going to give you one of the easiest scriptures in all of the Bible as to how to do that. It's not so hard. In John chapter 5, verse 24, in fact, I think I shared this with Trish when I, we were visiting with her several days ago, and, and I said, it's just one of my favorite scriptures because it, it has a meaning that goes beyond what we think about a time like this. Let me read it for you and, and then expound on it just a few minutes. Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that has sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but be passed from death unto life. My word, that's just so easy. How can you look over that and not get it? First of all, he who hears my words, we know the Bible says, faith comes by hearing. Hearing comes by this precious, powerful word of God. If I were to ask you to raise your hand, many of you would, that came to Christ because the word of God began to stir in your heart and draw you to him. Fall of last year, I had a chance to go over to Turkey. I go there often, try to witness the Muslim people there. And we were talking to a young lady who had requested a Bible from one of the Christian churches. There are only a few in all of Turkey. And they told us about her. And we contacted her, and she allowed us to come and talk to her. So we went out, me and several other people, and, and met with her. And as we began to talk, she said, yes, I've read the Bible. Listen to what she said. She said, every time I start reading this book, my insides begin to shake and to quiver because it is so wonderful and it is so powerful. I can't read it without starting to tremble at this word and that's what it is it's powerful it's quick it goes right to the depths of our being and, and it is this word that you need to hear and if you are here today and you don't know Christ as your Savior and Lord 
You are hearing the word, and you will hear it from Pastor Reed. So what you need to do, hear it. That doesn't just mean let it go in one ear and out the other. It means to let it go into your mind and let it go into your heart and your soul and to have meaning. It means hear these precious words of Christ and let them change your life. I trust that you have heard those words. He said also, he that hears my word and believes. See, there's the most important word in all the Bible, isn't it? Believes. I am talking to someone now, and have been for some time, that thinks that God just chose the people that he wanted to be saved and nobody else will. Now, I don't believe that. And there are a whole lot of people that, that, that are moving in that direction because it's so easy. You don't have to do anything. God does it. He comes along and hits you over the head with the hammer of salvation, and you got it. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how that works because I didn't experience that. I experienced believing. Not only in my mind, I believed it since I was a boy. My mother and dad taught me and took me to church as a boy, and I heard about Christ, and I heard about God's love for all people, no matter who they were. Not just a few, everybody. Small, large, old, young, didn't matter. So if you're here today and you don't know Christ, there are no exemptions. Did you hear me? You are not exempted because you've been so bad. Remember, you can't do anything good to make God love you anymore. And you can't do anything bad to make God love you any less. Huh? Isn't that amazing? God loves you. And he wants you to believe, not that he was just a character that was born and walked in a, a place called Judea back 2,000 years ago. He wants you to believe him with the very depths of your being, the very belief of your heart. I not only believe he was a person, I believe he was the Son of God. Now, I tell you, I talked to a, a professor, college professor up in New York years ago uh, about God creating the heavens and the earth, and, and he made the statement, well, I, I just have a hard time understanding how there could be somebody out there that could create the heavens and the earth. And I said, well, look, don't misunderstand me. I have a hard time putting all that together, too. I can't explain it to you, but I do know this. When I believed in Jesus Christ, he changed my life. He changed my life. You've heard my testimony, most of you. And I, when I asked God to come into my life, he did. Hallelujah. And I knew he did. <laughs> you know, you can't be born again and not know it. How can Christ come to live in you and you not know that he's there? And you can't be born again and everybody else not know it. They're going to see the change that Christ makes in your life. Hear the word of God and believe. And he said, then you will have everlasting life. Most of y'all, I've talked, I think, to Glenn Hutto a while ago, and he said, hey, you know, it's not going to be long. People are going to be coming in here, and we're going to be there. And I said, you're right. And I don't fear that. As a matter of fact, I'll, I'll be glad for it. If we truly believe that heaven's going to be the place we all say it is, we ought to be more willing to go there than to hang around here in all this turmoil and problems and sorrow and sickness. Huh? We ought to want to go there. But you see, he said, you'll have everlasting life. Now, you know that. I don't need to spend much time there because I want to take my last few minutes on one other phrase here that I, I don't know that anybody's going to shout in a funeral, but you might on the inside. Huh? Listen to what he said. He said that uh, you will not come into condemnation, but you are passed from death unto life. Now, I've heard the term used a lot, and I use it myself, because it, it, it's a, it's a nice-sounding way to explain that somebody died. You know, they, they passed away. But the reality of this scripture is, Roger didn't pass away, <laughs> and neither will we. Huh? We're not going to die. We are going to be passed from this earth immediately in the twinkling of an eye, the snap of a finger, into the very presence of the living and the holy God. Amen? Isn't that amazing? Yeah, man, are y'all jealous that Roger's standing up there seeing all that stuff and all we can do is still think about it? All of those that have gone before us are making up that huge heavenly choir that maybe one day when we step into to the realms of glory, they're going to strike up an amazing grace and millions and millions of believers that are glad that they now live in a place where there is no more pain. Wow. No more tears. No more sorrow. No more death. Amen. We will just pass 
from this place to the place we're going to. I read a story years ago, and I've used it several times, of a little boy, about four years old, that got a terminal disease. His parents, of course, were distraught, didn't know what to do. Several weeks had gone by, and they noticed this little boy had said nothing about this diagnosis. They weren't sure if he even understood what it was. So the mother sat down with him one time and said, son, do you realize what is taking place? He said, I'm not sure. She told him. And he said, well, mom, but I only got one question. He said, what, what's it going to be like to go to heaven? And she said, son, do you remember sometimes when you're waiting in the afternoon for your dad to come home from work? And when he gets here, you go out in the yard, you play ball and wrestle and bounce around. You know, you come in the house and you sit down and play some games. And, you know, it becomes your bedtime and you sit down on the couch and you don't want to go to bed because you're spending time with your dad and you fall asleep. And your dad picks you up, carries you upstairs into your bedroom, puts you in the bed. And when you wake up the next morning, you're not on the couch down in the living room anymore. You're in the bed up in your room, and you don't know how you got there. <laughs> he said, yeah, yeah, I know that. She said, that's what it's going to be like when you go to heaven. You're going to go to sleep down here, and you're going to wake up in heaven. And he sat there a second or two, and he said, that's fine with me. And he did. And Roger did. And you and I will come to that place where one day we're going to pass from this life into the life to come. Roger, I know you were ready. You told me that 50 times in one day. Hmm? Now, are you ready? Are you ready to stand before God? Are you ready to let Jesus be the very sacrifice necessary unto a loving and a holy but a judging God that demands that our sins be forgiven and that we stand before him in the righteousness of Jesus Christ because that's what gets us there, isn't it? Not our works, not anything we've done. It is the application of the perfect and the sinless blood of the perfect and the sinless Savior to our life, huh? Have you experienced that? Well, if not, maybe you could just Check with me or check with Brother Reed after the service. Uh, you know, we don't have to do it out loud in front of people. We can talk about it in private if you're willing to do that. But you need to be ready for this same Jesus that Roger and you and his wife. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, amen. Lord, I thank you for these sweet, sweet times like this, Lord, that we can come back together after years of knowing each other. Lord, working for the Lord. Uh, I thank you for this place right here, Lord. Oh, my mercy. Thank you, Lord, for the almost 20 years I spent here and you taught me. Oh, God, you discipled me. You moved in my life and drew me to yourself. And, God, you called me and claimed me as one of your own. Thank you that Roger did that. Patricia's done that, Lord. All those people that we fellowship with over the years can look back and say, Oh, thank you, Lord, that you put us in a time and a place where we not only knew the love of God, but we knew what he said that others would know us by the love that we have one for another. We still have that love, Lord. When I walked in this place today, people were smiling. People were talking about those days that we spent together. Lord, those days are gone. Maybe there's somebody here today, Lord, that's not smiling. Somebody that's been torn apart by the hardships of life and Somebody that's been brought down, Lord, by the consequences of life, the struggles, the hurts, the pains, the sickness. It's all around us, Lord. And none of us are exempt. But, oh, Lord, there is a help. There is a hope. There is a bomb in Gilead, oh, God. And his name is Jesus who comes. Lord, to not only just enter our life, not only to assure that we will be with him forever, but, God, he claims us as a child of God. And, Lord, we can go on in this life with joy in our heart. No matter what happens here, we know that one day we are ready to stand before you. 
Now, Lord, will you please bless this family, Lord? I, I watched all these kids grow up, <laughs> spent time together with them, Lord. We've had so many wonderful experiences together. God, I pray your blessings and your peace, oh, Lord, your hand of mercy upon them, Lord, that you might move mightily in their lives. Lord, I thank you for the life of Roger Brew and what it meant to me and the joy and the, the times that we shared together. And now, Lord, we need to go out and do the same for others. Be an example of who you are. Be an example of being ready to meet you and lead this world. Lord, and we just thank you now for this time today that can, can bring a, not only a reassurance to our heart, it can bring joy, Lord. It can bring a freshness to our heart. And God, may you continue to move mightily that maybe somebody here might come to know this same Jesus that Roger knew all these years. We ask it in his name. And for his sake, amen. This time we're going to ask if you would to please stand with us again. And we're going to sing, Because He Lives, this morning. seated this morning. Thank you for uh, standing and singing with us, and uh, thank you for uh, the, the word from, from, from Brother Gene, Gene Flack, and he's been a blessing uh, to me and this church, and uh, we are thankful for him. And I didn't give him a time limit because normally it doesn't matter, and uh, so, <laughs> so uh, we, uh, we, uh, we love Brother Gene, and uh, he's, he's been a blessing uh, to this church, and uh, we love the Broom family, and uh, we're thankful for uh, Miss Patricia, and we're thankful for Brother Roger, and uh, thankful for the time that we've been able to spend with them. And I've known Brother Roger, uh, well, I grew up in Fort Mill, so I've known of Brother Roger uh, for a long time, but the last uh, three years, almost three years, I've really got to know him. 
and I'm so thankful for that. And he's been an encouragement uh, in my life, whether he was uh, coming here and sitting on this left side or whether it was at the house or hospital, uh, he's been nothing but an encouragement. And I would go to see him and pray for him. And uh, in return, he would pray for me and remind me that he was praying for the church and uh, for all that God has been doing here. And uh, Brother Roger Broom was a special, special man. And uh, I appreciate him. Uh, I appreciate him today and I appreciate him, his life and his legacy at this church. Uh, we are thankful and we're grateful here. Uh, we still have a lot of men and women that go to church here at CISC that their hands literally built this church. Uh, whether it's this building or the Family Life Center or all of, the, all of the blessings that we have on this campus today. And Brother Roger was one of those, was one of those men. And uh, Brother Roger, two things I, I've said about him and so many of the other men that have been here. Uh, physically, he built this place. Uh, his hands laid the bricks and his hands put in the floor. But even more importantly than that, um, he spiritually built this place. Uh, it was men like Brother Roger that showed up to pray for this church. It was men like Brother Roger that through the hard years stuck it out and continued to pray and continued to ask God for favor and purpose on this place and in these pews. And uh, it's because of men like Brother Roger and, and those of you that have been here and seen this ministry grow with Brother Roger and Miss Patricia. It's because of men like this that I have the honor to pastor this incredible church today. And I do not take that lightly. And I, I understand that there were men, our heritage here, there were men that came long before me that allows us to do what God allows us to do today. And uh, for that, I salute Brother Roger. And I thank you, Miss Patricia. Uh, and I thank you for your, your faithfulness to this church. The first, the first verse that came to my mind when I began to think about Brother Roger and I said this to the family, and I'll say it again this morning. A pastor friend and myself were just talking a few days ago, uh, and, and we were talking about the, the, the hard task it is of being a pastor having to preach funerals. And, uh, and I made the statement then, just a few days ago, before Brother Roger even passed away. I said, it, it is entirely a different service, and it is, in, it is completely different, and it's easy to stand to stand in front of a family and to stand over a person that has lived and, and preached their own funeral through their life. And that's exactly what Brother Roger did. Uh, for those of us that are, that are left here today, we don't, have to, we don't have to worry about where Brother Roger is today. We don't have to guess where he's at. Uh, we have not lost him. Uh, we know exactly where he is today. And as a matter of fact, just as real as 115 Massey Street is, as real as Sis Memorial Baptist Church is, there is a place called heaven. And as real as I'm standing on this stage behind this pulpit, Brother Roger is on streets of gold this morning. He's already seen the walls of Jasper. He's already seen the crystal sea. He's already been to the throne of Jesus. And we can celebrate and we can worship today because we know that Roger is more alive today than he's ever been in his life here on earth. And we can be thankful for that. I, the first verse that came to mind was Matthew 25. It's actually a, a few verses. Jesus is telling a parable. And he says in Matthew verse, or chapter number 25, Verse number 13, it says, Watch therefore, for ye know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. For the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country, who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went, and traded with the same, and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that received one went, and digged in the earth, and hid his Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh, and reckoneth with them. And so he that had received five talents came, and brought other five talents, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said unto him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. 
I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. And, and, and Jesus is telling a parable about a master who gave talents. He, he gave uh, money. He gave the ability to go and serve. The ability to go and do. And this man that received five talents went and he used what God had given him to, to make a profit. He, in other words, he took, what Jesus, he took what the master gave him. And then when Jesus or the master, when the master came back, he said, look what I have done with what you gave me. And the master looked at him and said, well done, thou good and faithful servant. And when I see, Brother Roger, I see a man that God gave many talents to. I see a man that God gave an incredible spirit to. I see a man that God gave an incredible personality and the ability to work with his hands and the ability to know how to build and all of these things. But Brother Roger did not sit on those things. Brother Roger, I believe with all of my heart, wanted to take what God had given him to be able to glorify and honor God and present back to him what he had been able to do with what God had blessed him with. Brother Roger was a servant. Brother Roger would do whatever he had to do, uh, even... Uh, even in the even in the last few times of being here at the church, man, he would he would pray with me. He would pray over our church. I've got a picture uh, on my phone uh, of him down in the Family Life Center. He was the only man in this church that knew how to cook a pot of grits. And I've got a I've got a picture on my phone of us sitting in the Family Life Center kitchen, and he's in there stirring the pot of grits. I mean, everything that went on here, Brother Roger was here. He was a servant. He was a servant, and uh, I think that that's part of the reason he was struggling so much here towards the end, is he didn't like for people to serve him. He wanted to be out serving other people, and uh, I think it even frustrated him when I was at the house a couple weeks ago. He couldn't get up to get that muscadine jelly, and that about drove him crazy, um, but I went and I found it. Carrie, th thank you. He was, he was adamant about the muscadine jelly, and uh, so I was able to serve him a little bit that way. But he loved, he loved to get out and serve. There's a couple of things that I believe we can see through Roger's life. If you don't mind, I want to take a few minutes. These are some verses when I thought of Roger Broom that God immediately laid on my heart. And I want to share them with you today. Uh, first of all, in James chapter number 1, verse number 22, the Bible says, But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. The first thing that came to mind is that Brother Roger was a doer. Brother Roger was a doer. And by, by doer, I don't mean that he just did with his hands. That verse is talking specifically about don't just hear the word of God, but let your life show forth the word of God. Don't just hear it and read it and come to church on Sunday and leave no different, but come and hear it, apply it, and take it, and let the Word of God change your life so that your life shows off the glory that belongs to God. And Brother Roger was a doer. Brother Roger was not one that just came to church to fill a pew, but Brother Roger lived the Word of God every day of his life. And there are people in here, just as Brother Gene just said, there are people in here that your life has been affected because he did not just come to church, but he lived the word of God and he lived the life that Jesus had called him to live in front of us. Brother Roger was a doer. He loved the word of God. But not only did he love the word of God, he lived the word of God. And if there's, when it's my time to come and it's my time to be laid before a congregation, I'll be honest with you. I don't want someone to say how great of a preacher I was. I don't want someone to say how great of a pastor I was. But the greatest compliment that you can give a child of God is that they were a doer of the word and they lived the word to the best of their ability. And I believe with all of my heart that Roger Broom was a doer. He did not just hear the word, but he aspired to be godly and to be holy in everything that he did. He was a doer. 1 Peter 3.15 gives us this truth. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Not only was Brother Roger a doer, Brother Roger was a teller. Brother Roger loved to brag on Jesus. I'd go to his house and 
he'd sit back and he would tell me about the mission trips and he would tell me about all these things, but he loved telling me what God had done in his life. He loved telling me about how, how God saved him. And he loved telling me about how, how God had blessed him and how God had moved in his life and their family's lives. He loved to tell people about the hope that he had found in Jesus Christ. And I don't know that there was a person he ever met that he did not tell them about Jesus. Brother Roger was always looking for an opportunity. He was always looking to tell somebody about Jesus and what Jesus had done in his life. And I'm thankful for that today. That is an example that has been set and continues to need to be set in our day and time. We need some folks that we can look up to that we're not ashamed of the gospel and we're not scared and we're, and we're not fearful of telling people what Jesus had done for them. And Brother Roger was not only a doer, but Brother Roger was a teller. Matthew chapter number 28, verses, 18, or verses 19 and 20 uh, we are given uh, what we know today as the Great Commission. Matthew chapter number 28, verses 19 and 20 say, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. The, the, this, these words came to mind. He was a doer. He was a teller, uh, but I might have made this word up. He was a goer. He was a goer. Brother, Brother Roger loved, he loved missions. He loved to go, go on those trips to Peru and to Mississippi and Kentucky. And uh, y'all kind of went all over the place, didn't you? Uh, went, went all over the United States and, and the world just to tell people about this man named Jesus. When Brother Roger passed away early Saturday morning. Uh, I found out a little bit later, I was actually out of the country myself on a mission trip in uh, Puerto Rico. And uh, I got on the phone with Miss Patricia and, and, and Miss Carrie, and I was, I, I'll be honest with you, I was heartbroken that I wasn't here. But me and Patricia got to talking, and we began to talk about those mission trips that Brother Roger took. And I told her, I said, the first, one of the first things that came to mind is I, I'm sad that I can't be there but at the same time, I know how proud he would be to know that there was a group of people from his church in another country telling, telling other people about Jesus. And uh, Friday night, we were able to preach the gospel to over 200 Puerto Rican uh, citizens. And all I can think about Saturday morning when I got the news was I know Brother Roger would be so proud. And, and, and he loved to go. He loved to go and build the houses for the missionaries. He loved to go and help with the block parties. He loved to go. But why did he love to go? Because he wanted as many people as possible to know the same Jesus that changed his life. See, Brother Roger today, Brother Roger today was a doer. He was a teller. He was a goer. He was a worker. He was a servant. He was a disciple. He was a deacon. He was all of these things. But he did all of those things because of the fact that Jesus had changed his life. Brother Roger today is not in heaven. My confidence in his being in heaven today is not because of all of the incredible things that he did. But my confidence in where he is today is because he did all of the things he did because Jesus had done a work in his heart. See, he did not serve God to be loved by God. He served God because God loved him. And today, we do not go to heaven based on our works. Ephesians chapter number 2, verses 8 and 9 tell us, For by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And today, Brother Roger is not in heaven because he was a fantastic husband, and he was one. Brother Roger is not in heaven today because he was a great daddy, and he was one. Brother Roger is not in heaven today because he was a deacon, a missionary, a servant, or a great-grandfather. Brother Roger is in heaven today because there came a point in time in his life where he understood that he was a broken, lost, sinful individual, but that Jesus came to this world to shed his blood on the cross of Calvary so that Brother Roger could have forgiveness and Brother Roger could have eternal life. And today, that same opportunity is available to you. I love what Brother Gene said. God is not up in heaven 
telling well you can come and you can't and you can come and you can't. The Bible all through scripture, John 3 16 says for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You have an opportunity and to be honest you have a decision to make today. See, Brother Roger is in heaven because he made the decision to say yes to Jesus. And I know that I will see Brother Roger again today, not because I'm a Baptist preacher, not because I do religious things, but today I have come to the same point that Brother Roger had to come to, and that was that I am nothing without the God of my salvation, the God, my creator, doing a work in my life. And there came a point where I had to say yes to Jesus. There came a point, Brother Terry, where I had to understand that I was a sinner, that my life did not honor God. Nothing about my life pointed anything or anyone to Jesus. But the day that I said yes to him, the same blood that was applied to Brother Roger's life and to Brother Roger's heavenly account was applied to my life and to my heavenly account. And so today, I'm not saying goodbye to Brother Roger. Patricia, you're not saying goodbye to Brother Roger. Brother Roger. Family, if you've trusted Christ today, you're not saying goodbye to Brother Roger. And I know it's cliche. And I know we get in these, these habits of using these terms during funerals. But it's not just a saying. This is not goodbye. But there is coming what we used to call back when I was growing up. They called it a great getting up morning. There is coming a morning when the Bible says that the eastern sky is going to part. The trump of God will sound. There will be the voice of an archangel. And Jesus himself, the Bible says that the angels looked at the disciples and said, Why are you standing here gazing? This same Jesus that goes, he will likewise come again. And there's coming a day where this body will no longer be in a casket, Miss Patricia. There's coming a day where this body will be called from the ground. The Bible says that at the moment the trump sounds and the voice shouts that those that are asleep in Christ, those are dead in Christ, will rise first. And then those of us that, will, that remain will be called to meet them in the air. And this morning I have that hope as much as I know uh, that I'm going to go pick my kids up from school and go to a baseball game this afternoon. I know that there is coming a day where Jesus is coming back for his church. And I know that there is coming a day where if he tarries, I'll go the same way Brother Roger did. But it won't be a sad day. and It won't be a worrisome day. It's going to be a day full of hope. Because I've put my trust in Jesus Christ. And it's the same Jesus that Brother Roger trusted. And today, friends, today, family, I want you to hear my words. And I hope you heard what Brother Gene said. Heaven will not be ours because of anything we've done. Heaven will be ours because of what Jesus has done for us. And let me tell you what Jesus did for you. Jesus came to this earth over 2,000 years ago in the form of a baby. Jesus has always existed. He came to this earth over 2,000 years ago in the form of a human baby to feel every pressure and every pain of life that you and I feel. He lived the life that we were supposed to live. He honored his father. He honored God the Father in everything that he did. He never sinned. But then he died the death that you and I should die because of our sin. See, this morning the Bible says in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's all of us. That's from the preachers all the way to the, to the back. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. That word sin means that we've missed the mark. We've not lived to the standard and the, to the expectation that God had for us all the way back in creation. But the Bible says in Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. Total separation from him. Not only a physical death, but a, a spiritual death where we will be one day totally, totally separated from God and his love. But the rest of that verse says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, Romans 5.8 explains that. Romans 5.8 says, but God commendeth his love towards us. In that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. When you were at your lowest, and when I was at my lowest, 
And when Brother Roger was at his lowest, Jesus came and showed his love, and he gave his life so that we could live. You say, well, preacher, Reed, how do I make that my own today? I'll tell you how. It's not by saying magical words. It's not by giving into an offering plate or becoming a member of a church. The Bible says there's one place in the Bible where this question is asked, and that's in the book of Acts, chapter number 16, verses 30 and 31. There's a, there's a jailer. There's a man named, two men named Paul and Silas. They've been praising God in the prison, and at midnight, the walls begin to shake, and the jails opened up, and the Philippian jailer knew there was something different about these men. He said, what must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas answered, as simple as you can answer. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. How can you have the same assurance of heaven that Brother Roger had? How can you know that you'll see him again? It's simple. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Understand that he took your place on the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood so that you could find forgiveness and life eternal. And you say, God, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I have missed the mark. And today I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ as my substitute and as my Savior. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, I want to give you that opportunity. I, I want to give you that opportunity today. Miss Patricia asked us over the weekend. To, to have an, an evangelistic service. She wanted the gospel preached. And I'm going to honor her wishes and what I believe Brother Roger would want today. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never said yes to Jesus. Maybe you're here this morning and you've not made the decision that Brother Roger Broom made many years ago. Maybe you're here today and you've heard the gospel message for the first time this morning. You've, you, you've heard it a great word from Brother Gene, and I've done my best to, to, to explain the gospel to you this morning. That Jesus loved you so much, no matter what you've done. No matter the secrets, no matter the, the mess you think you've made of life. He loved you so much that he left all of heaven to come and die on a cross for your sins. Maybe you're here today, friends and family, and you'd say, Pastor Reed, I, I've never made... I've never made that decision to say yes to Jesus. I do not know right now if I'll ever see Brother Roger again. I do not know right now if heaven is my home. I've never said yes to Jesus, but Pastor Reed, I would love to make that decision today. If there's one here today, and I promise you, I, I, I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to call you out. But I, 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 want, I want to pray for you today. And I, I want to I tell you, like I just told you, how you can know for sure today that heaven is your home. Would there be one here that just by a simple raising of your hand would say, Pastor Reed, I've never made that decision to say yes to Jesus. I don't know that heaven is my home. But today I want to make sure that I know. Would there be one right now, just in the quietness of this moment, would there be one that would just raise your hand so I could see it? You can put it right back down. Would there be one this morning that say, Pastor Reed, would you pray for me? I have never said yes to Jesus, but today I want to make that decision. Would there be one? I want to give you just a minute. Say, Pastor Reed, would you pray for me today? By our testimony this morning, every one of us in this building says today that we're going to heaven. By, by, by our testimony in this, in this building today, everyone in here, without a lifting of your hand, you've said, I know that heaven's my home. And if that is the case today, then here's what I want you to do. I want you to go and let Brother Roger's life, let his legacy be seen in your life. Family, go and be the doers that, 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 that granddaddy laid the example to be. Go and, go and be the tellers that that granddaddy and that dad laid the, laid the example and the foundation to be. Be the goer that brother Roger laid the foundation and example for us to be. And let's live our lives loving and living out the word of God every single day. I'm going to pray and then I'm going to ask Reverend 
Norman Fieldbeck, if he would come and give us some closing remarks and close us in prayer. I'm going to pray for us this morning. God, we love you. Lord, we thank you for, God, your spirit here today. I thank you for your spirit of comfort. God, I thank you for, uh, Lord, just the reminder of how, of how real heaven is. And God, every, every time one of your dear saints is called home, God, it makes heaven that much sweeter. God, I thank you for the example that Brother Roger left his family, his friends, and his church. God, I thank you for the encourager that he was. God, I thank you for the, uh, Lord, the, the prayer warrior that he was. I thank you, God, for the life spent serving you. God, we are thankful today for the difference and the change that you made in his life. God, we know that he was who he was because of your goodness and your grace and your faithfulness in his life. God, we thank you for that. Lord, we love you today. God, we pray that you would continue to be with the family. Be with Miss Patricia and Kelly and Carrie and Benji. God, be with the, Lord, be with the grandkids and the great-grands. God, I pray that you'd be with, uh, Lord, the, Lord, the entire family. I pray that you'd just cover them in your love and your encouragement today. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. trying to figure out why they wanted me on the end. <laughs> you see, I've known Roger over 70 years. We've been friends all those years. And I need to probably tell you how we grew up and what we were doing, but I'm not going to. <laughs> <laughs> These men have bragged on Roger and I'll have to brag on him too all those years growing up we were in school together we were in church together we went to the second Baptist church next door and the second Baptist church had a school bus. Roger and Buck and Donnie, all those lived in town. I lived on Charlotte Highway, and I had to walk, but when they got that bus, I could come to church. I could tell you a lot of things, but I'm not going. We come to that point where we say to live as Christ and to die as gain. When Tricia called us and said that Roger had gone on, I rejoiced. As much as I loved him, I rejoiced because I had witnessed his going down about every time we went up there and if I ever get to that place I pray that God will be gracious to me and allow me to leave but Roger and Patricia we go back a long long way as a family we got married next door in that church 60 years Roger has always been a good friend. He was a good carpenter. He was a good mission worker. Did a lot of things. But he knew Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. If you're here, I pray that you'll speak to one of these men. Don't leave here without Jesus. 
I'm going to see God's going again. I'll see you there. This family is going to see him again that are saved. And I just pray that in this service, you witness a life that was lived for Jesus. A testimony that was given in his doing and the love that he had for his church and his Lord and his family. That's how we're supposed to be. That's what we're supposed to be. Let's close in prayer. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we come to this time. Lord, we know this service is over, but Lord, we also are aware that Roger is rejoicing, and we're envious that he's there before us. But Lord, we're going to see him again, and we're going to walk with him on the streets of gold. We're going to understand as the Bible says, it better by and by. And Lord, I just pray that you'll support, that you'll strengthen, that you'll give us the grace that we need in hours such as this. Forgive us for our sins, guide and direct us. And this is our prayer with thanksgiving. In Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Amen.